Good morning and welcome to the Ubiquity PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Nick Waters, CEO. Good morning to you. Great, thank you, and good morning to everybody. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the half-year results for Ubiquity up until 30th of June this year. Um, perhaps I can start uh, by introducing myself and my co-speaker, Alan, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've been with Ubiquity for two years now, just over two years. Prior to that, I spent my career with agencies. I spent 18 years at WPP and then 10 years with uh, Aegis, which became Dentsu Aegis Group. Um, Alan uh, is very capable of introducing himself. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm Alan Newman, and I'm the, I've been the Chief Financial Operating Officer of Ubiquity since uh, January 2019, so just over three years. Um, and before that, I was CFO of YouGov, so I've spent quite a bit of my career working uh, as uh, on the board of uh, and running um, media uh, related companies. Um, I have also was prior to that uh, in public practice as a consultant working in the media industry as a partner at KPMG. So uh, also gave me some experience of what it's like to actually go and sell to clients. Thank you, Alan. Um, so we've had a broad based positive performance in the first half of the year. Um, both around the world and by segment of our business. It's been driven largely by the media performance service line, which includes the newly acquired companies. Uh, we made three acquisitions in the first half of the year. We'll talk a little bit more about those later in the presentation. We've also seen continued high revenue growth from our digital media solutions. Um, a various number of factors have uh, contributed to a significant improvement in our operating margin. We'll talk about those uh, a little bit later during the presentation as well. And we expect our full year results to be in line with market expectations. So I'll pass to Alan now to talk through the numbers before I come back. Thanks, Nick. <clears throat> so overall, our revenue in uh, the first half of this year was 37 million, which was a, a, a total growth of 16%. Um, within that, our, uh, we had the benefit of the acquisitions. We made three acquisitions in a year, uh, two large ones uh, completed in April. And um, with that, excluding those, we had achieved organic growth of 7% uh, from our existing business in the period. Um, we managed to uh, reduce, maintain the operating expense growth well below revenue growth. Uh, and you see over, in overall terms, 8% uh, growth in our operating expenses. And again, referring to the existing business, uh, its expenses grew by 4%. So just really uh, in line with inflation, supporting um, a much higher revenue growth. And that gearing effect, if you like, of being able to manage our costs and grow revenue faster than costs is really what's contributed to an underlying operating profit increase of 117%, so doubling of our underlying operating profit in the period compared to the uh, same period last year. And we've said very clearly our, our aim has been to improve our operating margins over the medium term. And these results really show us a really good step along the road, seeing our operating margin growing from 7%, nearly doubling to 13% in the period. With relatively stable finance costs in the first half, uh, this fed through to underlying profit before tax. Uh, and to earnings per share, which doubled in the period compared to last year. We've put on this slide just a reminder of the highlighted items, partly because uh, we have an, an acquisition which will be um, paying continued consideration on next year digital decisions, and we're having to account for that cost of the, the uh, contingent, contingent consideration as a PL item uh, because the vendors have to stay in business until, um, until it's paid. Uh, and we had some acquisition costs. We've also ex announced that we're reviewing our Russian operation in the, uh, given the effect uh, of the Ukraine uh, in invasion um, and uh, of the fact that sanctions are being imposed on some Russian entities. So our operation in Russia is self-contained. It just only serves Russia, but we are reviewing it and aiming to divest it 
um, I mean, the interim period, whilst we're seeing if we can get that done, we have impaired the assets. So there's a charge for impairment uh, for that Russian business. Looking at our balance sheet, uh, quite a lot going on in the balance sheet. Uh, firstly, because of the growth in the business due to the acquisitions, our net assets increased uh, nearly double from 23 million to 42 million. Within that, our goodwill uh, in the balance sheet increased, uh, again, directly reflecting the acquisitions. We also had an increase in working capital in the period through a combination uh, of factors. So working capital grew from 4 million to 12 million, so effectively an outflow. Um, that was partly because of phasing of existing business projects was later in the period than compared to the previous year. So we we're accruing the income for those before we can actually bill that, that revenue. Um, and we also had an increase in debtors whilst um, in the process of um, moving our clients within our American uh, business that we acquired called MMI onto the ubiquity um, terms and contracts. That took some time with clients taking time to process the, the, the paperwork, as it were, for that. So our debtor days increased to 81 days compared to 60, but we expect that to be coming down quite fast in the second half of the year and returning back to normal. Uh, towards or towards normal by the year end. Another aspect in the balance sheet is a deferred consideration. I've just referenced digital decisions. Um, at the moment, we're expecting the payout for that to be about 14 million in May, April, May 2023, once our 22 accounts are uh, approved. And we're accruing that through the period of the, uh, the post the acquisition until the end of this year. So we've accrued five, six of that um, which makes 11.4 million. We've also, for the first time, started to uh, recognise the fact we have contingent consideration for MMI. That, as I said, we bought in April. There is uh, an earnout due for the vendor uh, based on the one times the EBIT, that is the underlying operating, operating profit, for 2024 of our entire American business. So they're incentivised to help us improve profitability of our existing business as well as the MMI segment and the two businesses, as I've already said, are being, have already been merged and will be operating as a single entity. And we've estimated that payment to be £2 million, which is due in 2025. Our net debt has increased uh, in part because of the acquisitions and in part because of the working capital that I've already mentioned. And that's gone up from £4.8 million to £12.9 at the half year. Um, now, it's normal that our half year Cash um, is lower than our year end cash and our work debt debt goes up. And as you can see in uh, the next, this next slide of cash flow, at the bottom there, our cash balance of 9.3 million actually coincidentally turns out to be exactly the same as it was in June 2021. Um, but there's a few moving parts as how we got there. Firstly, we had uh, cash generation for operations, uh, an outflow of 3.4, of which 1.6 million is our operating. Uh, business and the other is due to the highlighted items um, and then we've also had significant investing activities as I've mentioned and next mentioned so we spent 16.5 million on the three acquisitions of Ford and Semple, MMI and MediaPath uh, just breaking that down a little bit MMI is about 8 million and, and MediaPath uh, in total and MediaPath 15 but some of that was funded through issue of shares to the vendors and Form Semple is a very small acquisition, only a million dollars. The financing, on the other hand, we received and, and, and net 14.4 million proceeds from the equity issue that we undertook in May, the placing to fund the acquisitions. And we also increased our bank borrowings by four and a half million in part to fund the acquisitions. And uh, we've also had a movement to IFRS 16, the lease payments uh, that, come, that go out. Looking um, then at our debt, just really explain here the progression of our net debt and our cash balances so that people understand. So I mentioned the movements where we tend to go up a little bit in the mid-year and then come back down um, a full year. So you can see that our net bank debt was 9.6 million in June 21, went down to 4.8 in December. It's come back up again in June and is already by the end of August coming down as we collect uh, the um, uh, from the invoices we've issued just before the period ends. So we've already collected 2.4 million uh, in the two months to the end of August, 
level, bringing us uh, our uh, net debt down and, and towards the level we expect it to be by the year end, which will, as I already said, be lower than at the end of June. So I hope that, um, uh, and sorry, and then looking at our uh, business, we, at the moment, publish a, a, a segmental analysis which dis distinguishes between our media business, which is now by far the largest, and which the acquisitions um, all fall into that category. Um, and therefore, media revenue is up 21% in total, including the acquisitions, and its operating profit increased by 45%, really flowing through from the revenue, um, but also reflecting a higher margin. And that is really a combination of factors. One is that we have our digital media solutions are growing well, and they are inherently higher margin than our um, analog business. And we also, the acquisitions themselves, both had higher margins, underlying margins than the business, than our existing business, and they've already begun to contribute um, to our margins. On the other hand, our analytics and tech business, which is a lot smaller um, part of our business, its revenues actually fell by 10%, but as you can see, operating profit increased by 25%, reflecting really a, a higher margin project mix, which in itself resulted from active management of our client accounts to make sure that we were um, beginning to uh, focus on or focusing much more on, on projects which make a better margin and actually being more robust in our pricing of projects and in some cases we actually turn down work or our clients refuse to pay more and we actually ended up with a higher margin as a result so better quality business all around so i hope that explains the components of um, our financial performance in the period and uh, hand back to nick to talk more about our strategy and, and what's uh, driving our business Great, thank you very much, Alan. I'll give you uh, a progress update, but uh, just to start with a reminder of uh, who we are, what we're in business to do. So we exist to help brand owners increase their returns from their media investments and therefore improve their business performance. We have four elements to the strategy to help us uh, achieve those goals for the business. Uh, the first is to increase revenue from digital services by developing a range of productized data solutions. The second is to build on our um, very strong customer base and to build higher value strategic relationships. The third is to improve our operational uh, efficiency, which as you'll have seen from the numbers Alan took you through, we're making good progress against. And the fourth is to strengthen the business in the very important geographic regions of North America and Asia Pacific. Um, before I get into that, just a, a brief overview of the market that we operate in. The first half of the year was uh, buoyant for the advertising markets globally, but since then we've seen some mixed signals emerging and there's a few data points behind that. Um, in the United States, the month of July saw a 12% drop in uh, advertising expenditure, which was the biggest monthly drop since the pandemic started. Um, but at the same time, uh, there were some positive results um, reported. So Disney reported uh, record upfront advertising sales of $9 billion. NBCU also reported strong upfront sales of $7 billion. Here in the UK, the IPA Bellwethers report for Q2, again, there were mixed signals. The majority of advertisers, survey respondents, uh, were pessimistic about the near-term future for the companies they work for. But at the same time, a majority of marketers were planning to increase marketing budgets rather than decrease them. You'll also, um, I'm sure, be aware of uh, fairly disappointing results from the major tech platforms at the half-year mark compared to um, quite encouraging results from major uh, agency holding companies. So uh, a range of mixed signals. Clearly, there are significant storm clouds on the horizon, both in the wider economy and therefore potentially in the advertising market. But I would say they've, they've yet to hit. Um, and certainly I would think Q4 is largely baked in now. We have seen um, some reduced agency selection activity this year. That's really because 2021 was an unusually high year, um, full of pent up demand from 2020 when advertisers didn't put their business up for pictures. They had other things to worry about during the pandemic. So we're probably back to um, more normalized levels of agency selection activity. 
I referenced um, the uh, disappointing half-year results for the major tech platforms. I think for the first time we've seen the duopoly coming under pressure. Alphabet, I think, is in a stronger position than, than Meta. Uh, their search business uh, remains uh, extremely important, strong, resilient, and dominant. Uh, YouTube remains a good uh, proposition. Whereas Meta, I think we are really starting to see the impact of uh, Apple's introduction of the app tracking transparency um, solution. I think Zuckerberg said that'll impact Meta's advertising revenue by about $10 billion. Um, but we're also seeing weakness in Snap and Twitter and some of the minor players. Uh, great strength from TikTok starting to eat into the revenues there. We're also seeing a very, very strong flow of advertising dollars in the US into uh, both connected television and commerce media. Um, commerce media, obviously, everybody's very familiar with Amazon, but other retailers are now starting to aggressively monetize their um, real estate, their online real estate. Um, although that activity is uh, most pronounced in the United States, we will start to see uh, it flow towards this and other markets here in the UK. ITV will launch ITVX in the fourth corner, really being the first mainstream offering for advertising in the connected TV market. We see a risk of uh, the challenges that uh, have plagued the, the open web programmatic market. We see a risk of those flowing into the advanced television market as well. Indeed, we see some of that activity in one or two countries already. And the final dynamic that uh, is of note is the subscription funded streaming services now launching ad funded models, quite how that impacts the market is clearly still to be seen. But we see clearly a lot of complexity in the market, which uh, is challenging for brand owners to navigate, and therefore supportive for the ubiquity business. At the end of 2020, we introduced a range of operating metrics by which uh, we would um, navigate the business. Um, we published progress against them at the end of 21, and you can see those increased numbers there in the, in the middle column. Here at the half year mark 2022, we won't um, publish the actual numbers, um, but we will refer to the fact that we're on plan or ahead of plan against each of the metrics, uh, except for that final one percentage of revenue um, derived from the digital media services, we will see a dilution of that owing to the uh, acquisitions we brought in, whose businesses were both skewed to the broadcast sector. But we'll come back with the full year 22 results and provide an update on the actual figures. The digital media solutions portfolio um, remains focus of our, our product strategy at the moment. We now have seven productized data-led solutions in market and revenue continues to grow strongly from them. Through 2021, revenue from this uh, business stream uh, grew by 260%, but there was a law of small numbers at play there. For more robust uh, revenue scale, we're continuing to grow that aggressively with 90% and importantly, um, at, a, at a strong operating margin over 50%. One of the products we've introduced is the uh, Responsible Media Investment product, which we piloted in the US and the UK um, last year, and that provided uh, sufficient interest um, to advertisers that we've now, now rolled that out to a further nine markets. We are working on solutions for the advanced television and commerce media markets. Um, and we aim to bring the first one regarding advanced television to pilot in the US in the fourth quarter of this year. <clears throat> An update on the acquisitions. We made three acquisitions in the first half of this year. Uh, we can uh, describe two of them as strategic acquisitions and the third as, as tactical. Um, just to recap, Media Management Inc. was acquired in the United States, and the primary strategic rationale for that was simply to acquire scale in the U.S. Compared to the opportunity in the market, we felt we were somewhat underweight. So uh, the acquisition of MMI doubles the size of our business in the U.S., giving us much greater presence and credibility in that critical advertising market. 
Media Path Network was uh, also acquired in uh, late April, and the primary strategic rationale for that was the technology platform that it brought to us, a platform called GMP365, which would uh, enable us to run more of our business in a, a time-efficient manner, uh, reducing human intervention and replacing that with um, very strong technology. And the third acquisition, a small tactical one in Canada, um, to add a little bit more scale to a North American business. Those uh, acquisitions have contributed almost a million pounds to underlying operating profit. In the US, we've brought those two uh, companies together, um, Ubiquity US and MMI. They're now operating as one merged business. We've captured uh, all the cost synergies we intended to, or we aim to in 2022, uh, and we see opportunities to realize more in 2023. Um, the integration of Media Path takes a different form in that that was a globally distributed business operating off the technology platform. So our task there is to start um, transitioning our business and our clients onto the technology platform. Um, that will take us uh, a number of years. We see a three-year program really to, to transition the majority of our business onto the platform, but we've already started doing so. We've won our first new client mandates with the GMP365 platform as part of our service proposition. We've seen some of our existing clients renew and we are starting to achieve early cost synergies there. We have a, an exceptionally strong client base. We work with 28 out of the world's top 30 advertisers and more than 70 of the world's top hundreds. Um, so the, the, the challenge or the task there is to increase the value of those client relationships. So we've segmented them into current high value clients, clients where we see high growth potential and new economy businesses uh, and are uh, adopting key account management strategy based on um, those segments. We have achieved a number of um, positive wins in the first half of the year, and I call out a few of them there. Brown and Foreman in the US is a brand new logo to us. We've not worked with Brown and Foreman before, um, and that's pleasing as it shows the improving competitive nature of our US business. PepsiCo in India, I'm particularly pleased with. We launched uh, our business into India organically in Q3 of last year. India's a, a, a really vibrant advertising market, very complex for brand owners to navigate. So we felt that would be very supportive for our service proposition and to have been appointed by PepsiCo, one of India's top 10 advertisers and, and quite possibly a top five advertiser, I think is testament to um, the, the credibility of our service offering in that market already. Uh, Virgin Media O2 here in the UK, a very large merger of two big businesses, a very competitive tender that we won out in. So um, very encouraging to see the competitive nature of our business here in the UK to secure large, um, large client assignments. Um, I call out two um, global agency selection mandates from Jaguar Land Rover and BMW demonstrating our continued strength and competitiveness in that, uh, that segment. So our client uh, development strategy continues to progress well. <clears throat> We've referenced the importance of improving our operating margin coming off uh, single digits last year, almost doubling it to 13% uh, this year. There's a number of drivers of that. Um, we have reduced the production costs required to provide our service quite materially. That's a combination of reducing reliance on third-party outsource providers and also um, the synergies we've captured primarily in the United States in reducing uh, acquisition costs of third-party data. Um, essentially, both MMI and ourselves were acquiring data from suppliers such as Nielsen. We've been able to merge those contracts and eliminate quite a bit of cost there. That's been coupled with um, good, strong uh, cost containment on uh, our existing or core ubiquity business, if you like, managing that to just 4% uh, growth in the half year. We've also um, shifted the mix of our revenue towards higher margin solutions. I've referenced the uh, digital product solutions there, growing strongly with a 50% plus margin. Alan's also referenced an improved um, profitability in our uh, analytics business. Um, if you like being more discerning about revenue and servicing less um, non-profitable or low profit revenue. So we've deliberately um, accepted revenue going backwards in return for a much higher profit contribution. 
It's also worth noting that both MMI and Media Path uh, were higher margin businesses than Ubiquity in the first place, so they were both mar mar uh, margin accretive, and the uh, additional scale brought in has enabled us to, to leverage our um, uh, off our existing overheads better. We had, prior to the acquisitions of MMI and Media Path, we had a media operations centre, um, effectively acting as a scale of delivery centre. We've continued to, to utilise that um, in more uh, instances, um, taking work away from higher cost centres and improving our efficiencies and economies of scale there. Um, and we've delivered a 37% increase in productive hours served by that operations center. So a range of drivers of the improved margin performance and we see the opportunity to continue pulling those levers. We've referenced our ambition to scale in uh, strategically important markets. The world's largest advertising market is the United States, second largest is China. So we have placed a degree of emphasis on increasing the scale of our business in both the US and Asia Pacific. We've referenced already the acquisition of MMI and Ford and Semples, both um, contributing significantly to the revenue growth in North America, up 90% in the first half of the year, um, helping us achieve and deliver greater economies of scale for profitable growth in North America. Um, particularly pleasing, though, is the rate of organic growth in Asia Pacific. That's our fastest growing region organically, 38% uh, revenue growth. Um, with a strong contribution from China. We've also seen uh, a strong performance in continental Europe where organic revenue has grown by 13%. Um, strong drivers from France, Italy and Spain. Um, perhaps a market where we wouldn't necessarily have expected uh, double digit organic growth being a, a mature market, highly competitive market and a, a relatively low growth market. So that's very encouraging in continental Europe. So to summarise, the outlook uh, is positive. We expect to see our full year 22 results in line with market expectations. Um, and as the storm clouds on the horizon uh, gather, there is the resilience built into our business in terms of the service provision. Uh, in, in difficult times, advertisers would be expected to put even more scrutiny on their media investments to understand the efficiency uh, with which they're buying them and the effectiveness of the channels that they are buying. Um, now, clearly, there is there is risk to that. We are not immune to um, budget cuts, as uh, other line items would be, but there is resilience built into our um, product and service offering. Um, we, we must obviously note uh, um, a degree of caution around inflationary pressures. We won't be immune from them. Um, I think the cost of living challenges, uh, particularly for some of our um, more junior members of staff or lower income members of staff, we will uh, seek to alleviate with um, some relief payments there. Uh, but we do see the opportunity to balance those inflationary cost pressures with some of the operating efficiencies we've already described um, and we'll continue to focus on as we go forward. So we do see continued opportunity for both revenue growth and margin enhancement. And we see our business as being well placed for long term sustained growth. Um, and that concludes the slides. Um, and we are, of course, very happy to take any questions you may have. Nick, Alan, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just using the Q&A tab situated on the right corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. If I could just ask you to read out those questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Certainly. Uh, first question from Mark A. Are the acquisitions of media management and media path now fully integrated? And what steps did you take to lock in the key personnel? So um, I think MNI is at a more advanced stage of integration. We have brought the teams together. Uh, we have uh, merged the management team. So members of the MNI team uh, have now taken senior posts within the combined management structure. Uh, clients have been novated uh, over onto Ubiquity Inc. 
contracts. Um, we have, um, I mentioned earlier, uh, effectively eliminated one of the Nielsen or, or data supplier contracts. We've now merged those into one contract. Um, we are going to market as a single proposition and seeking to cross-sell both MMI services into ubiquity clients and vice versa. So I think um, the integration of that business is very well advanced. Uh, the integration of the media path business I, I mentioned earlier is, is different. It will take longer um, simply because their business model is so different from ours. Um, effectively, a globally distributed business operating off a uniform technology platform, fairly geographically agnostic, whereas Ubiquity is aligned by geography. So the integration process will, there will take a little bit longer. Um, some members of that media path uh, team have joined senior positions within Ubiquity, uh, and we have uh, embarked on uh, the process of training up Ubiquity members of staff onto the uh, technology platform, the GMP365 platform, uh, creating a joint go-to-market and starting to transition clients onto that. But that is a slower uh, and slightly more complex uh, process. That's not a surprise. Uh, that's exactly as expected, and we continue to work on that um, from now on, um, certainly through the remainder of next year as well. Another question from Mark A, where do you see management focused geographically? Uh, will it be the US given the addressable market? And if so, how will you look to increase your footprint organically uh, dash MLA? Uh, yes, the US remains uh, a major focus for us, uh, as does Asia Pacific. I think realistically, Asia Pacific will be more of an organic story than uh, an acquisition story. Uh, much as I would like to find opportunities to acquire in Asia Pacific, I think um, companies that would be um, relevant, strategically relevant for us to acquire are, are less obvious uh, in that market. Um, we do believe there'll be opportunities to acquire in the United States. Now might not be the best time to do it for, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we need to focus on uh, integrating the business we've acquired and making those a success. Um, and. Uh, Secondly, the wider macro environment is a little bit more challenging, a bit more uncertainty. And of course, now we have to consider the um, very significant spread that's been achieved in the dollar sterling uh, exchange rate. So um, whilst M&A will remain on the agenda, um, I think our, our focus in the near term probably needs to be more organic. A question here from Steve K. Will you look to exit your Russian operations by the end of the year? Uh, yes, in theory. Uh, and we were well advanced in progressing the divestment of our shares in that Russian business to our local um, managing director, who is a minority shareholder in the business. Uh, that was all agreed and ready to uh, transact. Um, and then a new decree came out of the Kremlin fairly recently, just in the last three to four weeks, um, which does make it harder for that transaction to go ahead. Um, there is uh, apparently now some uh, approval process to go through. We're not familiar with the details of that yet. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the details are still yet to emerge. So theoretically, we would seek to exit those operations uh, in practice, it's difficult to know how feasible that will be by the end of the year. Question from Neil B. Could you talk about staff retention and hiring? What management gaps do you still have to feel in the scale of salary inflation you are experiencing? Uh, I, I think staff retention is uh, probably around about uh, normal. Uh, we've not seen any particular spike in retention challenges this year. We did have a bit of a challenge last year in a specific segment. Our marketing effectiveness team came under pressure for um, data scientists in particular um, and those with advanced analytics skills. That pressure seems to have dissipated a bit this year. Um, in our core media services business, I think there's not uh, at this stage an unusual um, uh, challenge on retention. Hiring, uh, I, I think, remains again standard, albeit within some segments there are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, different challenges. We see some upward inflation in certain skill sets, um, which uh, which certainly adds a little bit of upward pressure on salaries there. Uh, management gaps, I, I don't believe we have any um, specific management gaps. Clearly, there's always opportunity to strengthen in some areas, but. Uh, 
I don't see any specific gaps in the management team. The scale of salary inflation we're experiencing, um, as we, uh, um, we have um, one main um, salary review window in the year, which is in April, we take stock and have another um, uh, review, uh, a minor window, shall we say, in October, which we're just having a look at now. Um, for our April round, we uh, budgeted around 4 to 5%, which seemed satisfactory, but clearly inflation has uh, got a lot stronger since then. Um, I think uh, we will selectively um, reward people a little bit more than that in October, but it is only the minor window, and we'll have to plan uh, effectively for next April, and it's, uh, it, it's too early for us to do that yet. We haven't approached budget season. Uh, Another question from Neil B. Why was ad tech down 20% in the first half? Was it the continuation of the cessation of a large one-off project in the second half of 21? Well, our marketing uh, effectiveness and analytics business, we, we bracket together um, in uh, revenue terms. And uh, as Alan discussed during the presentation of the numbers, uh, we did have uh, several... Uh, relationships or projects in uh, 2021 that were, were not profitable. Um, so in retendering them or aiming to renegotiate the price to make them profitable for us, if the client wasn't willing to take that price increase, or if there was a tender, retender, um, and uh, we priced ourselves more expensively and didn't win that business, then we've effectively uh, um, improved the quality of the revenue. So we've taken um, a more discerning approach, I think you could say, to the revenue secured in that business line. Um, so we're not uh, concerned about the revenue going backwards. It's actually delivered and contributed actually a high amount of operating profit to the business. If I could just jump in, Nick, I think the question was referring to, us, to uh, the comment in the RNS where we specifically talked about ad tech. I mean, obviously, all that you've just said is absolutely right, but I think that is particularly, uh, was a small, uh, relatively low revenue service that we've actually merged <clears throat> into our media service now. So we're not really, it was really advising people on on how to make the best use of programmatic advertising and how to manage their partners. Uh, and so that's the real reason, it, the main reason it's down is because we're really scaling it down now and, it, and merging it, integrating it with our media services. Thanks, Alan. I'm it's a very sorry. specific. So it was about a one million. Yeah, thanks. I slightly misunderstood that question. Thanks. I, I think, Alan, while you're talking, you should answer the next one from Dion. Um, sure. sure. Um, yeah. So obviously, our market expectations in, in the way that the market works are based around, or are, as it were, communicated by analysts, um, or that, or their expectations are the consensus that that comes to the market. Broad terms, the. Uh, the EBIT line, the underlying operating profit, I think the market is now expecting us to be around £9 million pounds for the full year. Um, so we're, we're saying that we are in, well in line to achieve that. Um, the second question was, what are the current thoughts as to returning to paying a dividend? Thoughts at the moment are, are probably not in the, in the short term. Uh, there's no not been a lot of pressure from shareholders and given net debt, given that we think we can make best use of our cash by investing in, 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 in the business and continuing to improve its performance and delivering value to shareholders that way. Uh, I think for the you know, next year or two, that's probably where we'll be. Um, of course, it's not my decision, it's the board. So they, they may, uh, we'll, we obviously keep that under review every year, but that would be my current view. Um, the next question I got also answer roughly what proportion of the 14 million deferred payment on digital decisions do we expect to fulfill in new shares? Um, this is just to explain it's it's pretty much our option. There is um, a, a day minimus that that uh, the vendor can ask us to pay, um, uh, which is less than half. I think the working assumption again in in the in the sort of uh, analyst view that, that the guidance of the market is that it'll be probably 50% equity, 50% shares. Um, it may be slightly higher than that in terms of uh, equity, but it's that kind of uh, region that is, is what we're expecting at the moment. Um, and I'll also answer the next one from Vishal. Uh, please could you discuss the tailwinds 
from FX on your top line and margins over the medium term should sterling continue to hover at these historic lows. Um, is in broad terms, the UK sort of invoice business, as it were, even though that's not all in sterling, is about, um, well, sorry, UK local business is about 20%, and our international unit, which is also UK based, is about another 20% of our turnover. Um, so, put a different way around, more than half our turnover is actually outside the UK and predominantly in dollar, in dollar related currencies or in euro. So in broad terms, you'd expect that the fall in the pound would, would improve, would, would give us some upside. Um, but it's fairly well balanced because our costs are also, um, you know, going up at the same time. Um, America has traditionally not had that high, a bigger profit contribution. In fact, it was loss making last year. Now that we've got MMI and now that we're improving it, we expect to see some profit benefit from the more for America. So in very broad terms, I would say that the FX of fall in the sterling is beneficial, but it's fairly marginal in our business because the sort of balance is all over the place. Um, and, and sorry, the other point about FX is the relationship between the pound, the, the dollar and euro affects things as well, because euro against the pound hasn't actually been shifting very much. It's been it's the pound, the dollar is very strong. Um, the tax charge in H1 seemed high. I'm not sure what you're referring to high because it's actually come down since last year. Um, I think I've one of the challenges in if someone's comparing our tax charge with the analyst's view is the analysts have tended to put in what I call a pro forma, which has traditionally tended to be underestimating our tax charge. So I'm expecting the rate for the full year to be pretty similar to what we've got in for H1. In fact, that's actually how we calculate it uh, in the accounts is based on our forecast of the full year. Um, Nick, this is probably back to you on the next question. Sure. Um, question from Vishal. Please, could you also discuss the ability of the new and large business to retain, uh, to retain and attract new talent? Um, I think we, we've um, seen an interesting dynamic in that um, people from both MMI and MediaPath have expressed um, some degree of, of uh, positivity, if you like, in that now they're part of a larger organization, there is um, greater potential for career development and career path. So I, I think that has certainly helped um, retain uh, people from those companies. Um, I think there is a, a, a positive dynamic about having made the acquisitions, um, which encourage people at Ubiquity to see the positive uh, benefits of the uh, of the newly enlarged company. So I think retention at the moment is is um, fine, perhaps enhanced. That's not to say there will be there won't be some people who decide uh, that they don't want to be part of the new journey of the, the newly acquired ubiquity, but we haven't yet seen that happen. Um, similarly with attraction of new talent, a larger organization, we have um, a, a wider range of roles to offer people, um, positive momentum in, in the company. Um, so hopefully we appear uh, um, an attractive proposition versus other other players in the market. Um, and uh, at the moment, we're, we're seeing our ability to uh, attract talent as, as being quite, quite positive. Uh, another question from Vishal. Finally, please, could you also discuss any observable trends in your tender pipeline? size of deals, win rates, contract decision cycles, et cetera? Um, that's a good question, uh, Vishal. Uh, I don't think the size of deals particularly have changed. We are obviously seeking to, uh, to move them up, but I would say that's fairly stable at the moment, albeit we are moving the number of clients we have and this comes back to the strategy of developing higher value strategic relationships. We are moving um, clients up our, our total value relationship, if you like. Um, but that's really more about selling more products and services to them rather than the individual uh, project uh, size or size of deal. Win rates, um, uh, I think, uh, remain uh, stable. Uh, they're positive. We have a high, high proportion of successful tenders. Um, our contract decision cycles, I think, also remain fairly stable. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's any great different dynamic in the um, 
pipeline uh, or, or, or decision cycles. Neil B, do you have any new product introductions planned? Are you looking for further infill acquisitions? And if so, where? Uh, yes, we are working on two um, strategic product solutions, one to address the connected TV or advanced television market, which we aim to pilot in the US in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, we're still working on a, a solution for the commerce media market. Um, we won't uh, pilot anything in the fourth quarter of this year, but we are actively working on it. And we have some other solutions under development, um, which we'll aim to bring to market in Q1 or Q2 of next year. So there are still more product solutions to come to market. Are you looking for further infill acquisitions? Um, at the moment, I think because of the market conditions that I described earlier, um, it's not at the top of our priority list, but we do continue uh, to keep a, a, a view on the market, we continue to review the market. We continue to maintain or seek to maintain positive relationships with you know, the, 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 the principles, should we say, of, of potential acquisition targets. So um, it, it, there is a time, there will be a time hopefully when we can be um, active again um, and where, uh, you know, come back to the geographic strategy, North America, Asia Pacific remain high priorities. If we can find acquisition targets there, they would be priorities, but we would also um, be open to discussions with uh, companies that have uh, data, relevant data they can bring into, into the organization. So um, it's primarily geographically and, and data oriented. That's, uh, I think, all the questions um, in the box uh, that have come up now. Yeah, yes, I think it is. And I think you've actually managed to address all, all the questions from investors. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors, to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you both. Um, Nick, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Um, yes. I as I said um, in the presentation, the outlook is that we will uh, achieve the full year results in line with market expectations. Um, there are obviously clouds on the horizon. At the moment, um, we see our business as being uh, relatively resilient to that. Not to say we'll, you know, we will be immune to all the challenges, but we do see resilience built into our service offering. Um, as we move into next year, the focus continues to be on successfully integrating the acquisitions um, and with a particular priority on transitioning our business uh, over time onto the GMP365 platform that Media Path Acquisition brought with us. Um, so um, I think the, the strategy remains the same, uh, products, clients, operating efficiency and geographic uh, rebalancing. And that's uh, that's probably uh, the summary for now. Nick, Alan, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session, as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Ubiquity PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.